Good afternoon. It's uh, Friday, the 10th of April 2015. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host this afternoon, Brian Gerrish. Uh, with me in the studio is Nick Green, and uh, we'll be joined throughout the programme by David Scott, who will be, of course, giving us Northern Exposure, reporting what's been happening north of the border. But I'm going to say, due to circumstances that have been emerging over the past few weeks, we've decided to concentrate this news programme on the uh, very dangerous changes to policing style, uh, not only in Scotland, but also in the rest of the United Kingdom. And uh, we will begin with a short video clip of um, bailiffs at work with the support of the police in Manchester. Before we bring that onto your screens, let's just check in with uh, David. Are you there north of the border? Yes, Brian, I'm here. I am broadcasting from sunny Perth. Sunny Perth. Sunny Perth. It's uh, beautiful today. OK, well, we're delighted to hear that. Should we just stick on that as the weather report? That's good news. It's sunny in Perth. Um, not too bad here in Plymouth as well. OK, let's have a look at that video clip, which I think will shock many people. Britain, 21st century. <laughs> Welcome to the New World Order. We become very loose assistants. We're here on the Connell Avenue, Moscow, Manchester. Terrible. Hope it happens to their kids. You know. All right, five years you'll be working for G4S. See yeah. how much you're getting paid then. Yeah, there'll be no pension. Hey. Might happen to your kids as well, right. when, they're, when they're older. Selling, they're older. Out, selling, selling out your own people. people. Yeah, sure. Yeah, when your parents are not around. Selling out your own people. Terrible. All this for one man in Manchester, look at the state of it, eh? Yeah. In the London, where people, people don't like police. It's all right, the <laughs> time's coming. It'll be your turn one day, lads, trust Shame me. Shame on you. They're making plans to get rid of you now with all the layoffs and the cuts exactly, and everything. Yeah. Give us a it doesn't matter though, we'll still come and support you regardless. Selling your children down the river. Shame on you! 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 Facilitating the corporations once again. Bailiff's assistants you've become. Hey, to serve and protect. What happened to that? What happened to your own? Don't know. Working for bailiffs. What happened to your oath? You swore an oath. What are you doing? Soldier, fighting, fighting the people, protecting crime and corporations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Pedophiles. Protecting paedophiles, that's all you're doing. What's the point we'll in working just, we'll in this, uh, in this country if this has happened to you? Eh? We'll you, know you know what I mean? You know, what, 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 what do people work for? You know? He hasn't got no, he hasn't got no parents, either, you know what I mean? Yet you come and do all this to him. They might yeah, smile and all laugh at it, but at the end of the day, it might happen to your kids when you're, you know, when all you're using it. Right, when you're on half pay with no pension for G4S in five years' time, come, don't come running to us. Yeah. I don't think anybody in uh, Britain today can fail to be shocked by that example of a brutish and thuggish action by, I believe that's Manchester Police at work with, of course, the Tactical Support Unit. Uh, but what is interesting is we have here, of course, the police uh, acting to enforce um, a civil debt. The sum, I understand, was £6,000. 
uh, just look at the men, material, the way they dress, the slovenly behavior, the aggressiveness. This is not a dictatorship forming. This is a dictatorship, dictatorship operating on Britain's streets. And of course, it's one of the areas that many, many people have been warning about over a number of years. So today, armed with that uh, latest example of the uh, brutality and the paramilitary style of Britain's police force, uh, we're, we're going to devote the rest of today's news to a, a look, at, look through what is actually happening with Britain's uh, police. Before I just uh, hand over to, to uh, David Scott for his opinion on that uh, event, let's just remind ourselves of what took place when some 700 people uh, appeared on Britain's streets to support a gentleman called Tom Crawford, who was going to be evicted. I've got a photograph here. We'll just bring it up. Uh, well, this is the uh, picture from the Daily Mail article. Bailiffs trying to evict cancer-stricken father over mortgage dispute are forced to retreat after 500 strangers form human blockade around his bungalow. And I'll just inset there the report from the Nottingham Post, which gives a picture of uh, Tom Crawford. Uh, but of course, there were two events around this particular eviction. What's the difference? The difference is that in the second uh, case, at least, there were up to 700 peaceful neighbours and strangers from across UK who came together to protect this gentleman. I have a sneaking uh, suspicion that we saw this thuggish unit employed um, in the video film clip uh, because the police are becoming very frightened that ordinary people in Britain are now starting to peacefully support each other. David, uh, obviously events in Scotland are even worse because you now have a single police force with no separation of powers uh, from the Scottish state. Uh, had you actually seen that video clip before? No, that's a new one on me. Uh, it's it's very it's very concerning. I my my knowledge of common law is not is not the greatest, but I I thought that if you were dealing with a civil dispute over money, violence was not under any circumstances allowed. Oh, well, uh, this is correct, and of course, what the police should have been doing is simply uh, being there to keep the uh, keep the peace. And um, what, we're, what we're witnessing is, of course, the police acting simply as, as a thuggish army of the bailiffs. We, we've got uh, the system um, turned on its head here in order to um, support the recovery of money. So I think this is a very, very dangerous, not only attack on civil liberties, but also the law itself. It's interesting you use the word army. Police Scotland kind of of course, put 500 armed men into the field. And the danger of, with, with having a force like that is there's a great temptation to use it. The, there was a recent incident in Perth where uh, one um, perhaps somewhat disturbed young man who was staying at, at, a, at a hostel, so it's, it's someone who's not um, you know, in, a, in a position that's maybe less than ideal, uh, he was obviously a bit agitated and he was he was shouting out of a window of this hostel and throwing some of his furniture out of the window. Uh, a, a situation that I'm sure in years gone past, two or three policemen from the local uh, the local station would have been able to deal with. Uh, what we had was the riot squad, riot shields, and we had the armed response vehicle was summoned. Because uh, the armed response vehicle is only summoned if there's a threat to life incident. But of course, threat to life is, is a term which is interpreted by the police themselves. So throwing furniture and shouting and being agitated can be interpreted as being a threat to life. Because all you need is a little bit of imag imagination to, to go from that to some sort of genuine threat. Um, and with that little bit of imagination, you can summon the armed response vehicle and have armed police on the scene as well. So we had really quite a similar situation in Perth where something that would have been handled much more simply and unlike that was actually criminal, albeit only just, it, it, activity. Uh, but the police, rather than dealing with it in a quiet way, um, dealt with it with huge numbers, a lot of expense, a lot of kit, and uh, this being Scotland, uh, the presence of guns on the scene. Well, of course, the armed police are, are now creeping into the uh, picture here in, in uh, 
in England. And uh, I was told a couple of days ago that Devon and Cornwall police are now putting armed police patrols on the uh, A38 M5. And uh, c can I just ask you, I've heard a rumour that um, uh, Sir Stephen House in, in a talk or, or a comment made in, at a public meeting uh, was talking about subduing people by putting seven bullets in their heads. This, I think this is, this is the Panorama interview that was done in the wake of the killing of John Charles de Domenez on the London Underground. And um, the, the question was regarding whether the Met Police then under the, the direction of, um, amongst others, Sir Stephen House, he was the most um, directly responsible senior policeman for that incident. Uh, the question was whether the Met Police were operating a shoot-to-kill policy. I, and he, he stopped the interviewer and said, no, 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 you misunderstand. We don't have a shoot-to-kill policy. Police, the Met Police don't shoot to kill. They shoot to incapacitate. And the, the person doing the interview had the wherewithal to say, yes, by aiming at the head. And Sir Stephen House said, yes, by aiming at the head. So, so, so seven bullets in the head is, is not an attempt to kill you. Only, only to incapacitate you if you are Stephen House. Uh, well, David, this is remarkable, isn't it? Uh, what we're getting an insight here, we could say muddled thinking, we could use a term like this, or, or like that, I beg your pardon, or we could be saying that um, actually the police, senior police officers, are not thinking in a common sense way. They've lost the ability for reasoned thinking, I believe, Personally, there's a reason for that. It's to do with their training. Um, very interesting that you've mentioned Sir Stephen House with the, the um, Charles de Menendez incident because we're going to be talking later on about Cressida Dick, of course, who was the common purpose senior police officer in charge of uh, counter-terrorism ops. Um, but before we move on towards that, so I'll just say... Uh, that we understand that, of course, British Army units were also working alongside police around uh, that incident with uh, de Menendez. So uh, there was some very, very dirty dealing going on, much of it, of course, uh, covered up by the British state. Uh, but if we've seriously got police officers who believe that uh, we simply stop people by shooting them in the head, we've got some extremely um, dangerous and low empathy people running the police. <coughs> Well, let's contrast it with this. Um, uh, we've shown this over the last couple of days, but we'll bring it back on screen. This is Sir Peter Fahey, the boss um, of the um, Rochdale, Man well, so Manchester Police, isn't it? And um, uh, what are we picking up here? Well, the police have been failing. They can't get hold of the uh, paedophiles. And of course, when the police fail, well, nobody's going to be disciplined. And we've got rather different thing occurring around this lady, um, Melanie Shaw. So she bravely steps up to talk about her abuse and the abuse of up to 150 other children at Beechwood Children's Home, Nottingham. And uh, with the support of this gentleman, Chris Eyre, Chief Constable of Nottinghamshire Police, charges are cooked up, which means that this uh, very vulnerable lady is back in prison. And we understand uh, she is in Sodexo prison in Peterborough in solitary confinement. So on one hand, we've got police that are bringing these armed uh, SWAT teams, I'm going to call them onto the streets to deal with, with simply debt matters. We've got police, the same police who can't deal with paedophiles. There's something wrong in the police mindset here, uh, David, in my opinion. Yes, and it seems to be located at a high level of senior authority. Uh, I was interviewing uh, for, for the column a chap in Dundee who runs a, a charity who deals with, with the victims of child sexual abuse and satanic ritual abuse. Um, a, a, a very interesting gentleman called Joseph Mbazi. He, he was explaining a lot of examples of this. And one example that he mentioned was someone who'd come up from Manchester who'd been the victim of abuse and wanted to speak to the police, but was specific that she wanted to speak to any police force other than Greater Manchester Police. Why that should be, I don't know. Um, the uh, Tayside Police responded 
and two detectives were put on the case and were making excellent progress. The detectives were first class. The victim was talking. The and the trust had been developed and a story was flowing. Information was being gathered. The case was moving forward. The next thing that happened was those two detectives were taken off the case, were put back on the beat and a replacement officer came on, came on board. The victim had to start the story from scratch. Three months, very painful work, essentially in the, in, in the bin. And the authoritarian attitude of the replacement officer did enough to get the message across to the victim that um, really they should leave it. And, and the case eventually went nowhere. Now, that, that can only be achieved, as we've heard so often to do with the Met Police as well, that can only be achieved with people in high-ranking positions taking decisions that, are, that essentially undermine the officers who are in the front line, perhaps doing very good work. Uh, well, what a better time to introduce um, this headline, which we've shown before, but we're now putting it into context because we're back here with a report um, about, uh, this is the Scottish Mail, I believe. Uh, we've got Sir Stephen House here. This is the debate over uh, guns on the streets of um, Scotland. No chief constable can be a law unto himself. And the inset there says, I will decide what to do on guns, not politicians. So we've now got senior police who believe they are literally above the law. They're, they're not even involved in democracy because they can do, they can do what they want. And I'll, I'll bring up the next one, which you kindly provided for us. This is the Courier. Uh, former senior Tayside officer launches devastating attack on the head of Police Scotland. Are people beginning to pick up on this uh, man, David? Oh, yes, yes. So Stephen House um, has has been rumbled, I would say, by by the certainly by the press in Scotland, by some of the politicians, and a fair number of the people are extremely unhappy. In fact, I've seen more agitated, you know, on the streets presence to do with Sir Stephen House and particularly the guns issue than almost anything else in Scotland. Um, I... I, I a comment on the law unto themselves issue. There was a phone in about the the other police Scotland matter that's that's really agitated people, which is stopping and searching on a consensual basis children who are below the age of consent. Um, so this this practice had been quite common. It had been the, the, the so Stephen House had assured Parliament that it would stop. It wasn't stopping, and that was revealed through freedom of information requests from members of the Scottish press. And uh, this became somewhat of, of, a, of a hot topic. It was debated on, on um, Radio Scotland, and they had an, a, a recently retired Glasgow police officer, and his attitude was extremely frightening. His attitude was, if someone's needing to be searched, they're going to get searched. Uh, it doesn't matter what laws we have or haven't. We will find a way to search that person if they need searched. This is all cases where there's no evidence of, of, of wrongdoing or law-breaking, and the, the decision as to whether someone, quote, needs searched is happening between the ears of the police officer without any evidence. That's not lawful behaviour, and the, the whole attitude was very aggressive, very authoritarian and very concerning. To, to come on to on the matter of authoritarian and concerning, to come on to Sir Stephen House. The, the article that you showed there from The Courier was a very interesting um, piece by a former assistant chief constable of Police Tayside. She retired early because she couldn't stand what was happening to the force and has publicly called on Sir Stephen House to resign for the good of the force. Uh, a couple of interesting comments. Um, She's given a quote that apparently Sir Stephen House uses a lot in his own management team in Police Scotland. The quote is, you're either on the bus or under it. So that doesn't exactly show there's a very collegiate um, management style or an ability to listen to the other point of view. Um, she's also said that despite um, repeated warnings from her and other officers that visibly armed police officers would 
officers would make people on streets feel uncomfortable. That so Stephen House pushed on with the armed officer, uh, armed patrol uh, initiative. And um, she was further saying that there were quite clear targets for things like stop and search. So we're seeing, seeing something that's been driven very personally by Sir Stephen House and driven in a way which doesn't seem to have... I think we've got a, I think we've got a, fr a freeze on the um, Skype feed there. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to bring David back in. I'll just make some comment on uh, what, what he's uh, been talking about, uh, which is basically Sir Stephen House, um, the senior police cost constable in Scotland, making his own decisions on policing issues, policy, including guns on the streets. But David there is intimating that essentially what we're starting to see in Scotland are the police, senior police officers, operating outside authority, operating beyond authority. I'm deliberately using that phrase because, of course, it is a common purpose phrase. And uh, the other thing he mentioned there was that Sir Stephen House was saying, well, police officers of the force were either on his bus and presumably following his uh, personal agenda, or they were going to be under the bus. Uh, now, this is a very interesting uh, terminology because, of course, this is the exact language uh, that you can read in the uh, book Beyond Authority by political charity um, chief executive, sorry, uh, the uh, political charity common purpose chief executive, Julia Middleton, in which she is encouraging public officials and civil servants to lead beyond their authority. But in that same book, these phrases are used that if somebody gets in your way, you should bulldoze them aside or run over them. So I, I'm very interested in the uh, subtle parallels here between what we're seeing starting to happen on the streets of Scotland and the police and uh, what we can show in common purpose. And I'll try and connect the dots on that in a minute. Now, with a bit of an eye on the time, we'll just bring on to this one, uh, which is extraordinary. We're now using Lego. Um, to um, deal with serious issues of crime. What's this one about, David? Yes, this has not gone down tremendously well. This was the police using the using Facebook to get the message out on on crime and avoiding crime, but they're using Lego figures and poetry. And some of the forty thousand people in the the, the Edinburgh and Lowe's. Okay. Obviously, we're going to have one of those uh, in area who have been one of those days at the end of the week. Should we try a reconnection? I'll, I'll carry on through. If you can hear me, David, I, I, I'm, I've seen. I don't know what this, the problem is today, but uh, I think it's maybe because it's sunny. I don't think the internet in Scotland's used to sunshine. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, Shall we try again. Yeah, see if you can take us into that one again, then. We've got a we've got a police Lego campaign to talk about law and order. Sounds sensible to me. Well, yes, we've got here. Police are using Lego figures in a campaign to warn people about the rising tide of housebreaking in Scotland. Officers from Police Scotland's Edinburgh Division, which has seen break-ins soar by nearly 40%, posted pictures of Lego models on their Facebook page as a move to raise awareness of crime. And, and they also included um, what's been described as poetry, but little little rhymes and ditties to try and persuade people to to put on a, a, a light when they go out or leave the radio on or something. Um, it, it's not been well received. The people who are victims of crime in Edinburgh and Lothian would have expressed a preference for the police to be actually on the streets protecting people and not in, the, in their office um, playing with Lego and video. But there we go. Well, you're, you're smiling while you say this. And of course, many people will be smiling. I, I'm going to try not to smile. And I'm going to say there is something very sinister at work where we've got grown men and women who think they can deal with senior uh, serious matters like uh, crime and law and order uh, by presenting poems and uh, Lego figures. So where is all this stuff come from? Well, we've got to come back to people. It's not organisations that make decisions, it's people. Let's remind ourselves of a few things. 
Uh, it's election time. We're going to say is David Cameron fit to be re-elected? Because, of course, the Prime Minister must take ultimate responsibility for what's happening with the police forces um, across the country. Uh, can we trust this man? Well, we pointed out that it was David Cameron who said more needed to be done to tackle child abuse. But then, of course, it took the very brave MP Simon Danzuk to point out that David Cameron was simply wanting to move on from uh, any talk of child abuse in Westminster, move on, nothing to see. So we have to look at the people that have been governing this country um, over the last, uh, certainly over the last 30 years. We could go back further. We'll just say 30 years. These people have been responsible for the changes we've seen in the police. So here we are, uh, a little look at what our uh, police men and women looked like back in 1985. And um, they were doing a job. Some of them did the job extremely well. There were a few bad eggs. But if you look at this picture, at least you get the, the, um, the impression that you're dealing with fellow men and women. They look like normal people and uh, they're in smart uniforms and they were upholding the law. So that's 1985, yet by 2015, we've got scenes like this. Uh, we've got a semi-paramilitary police force. And of course, the bit we've just been talking about is that uh, we've now brought into that, um, uh, we've now brought into that armed police. So um, where has this dangerous change in policing, where has it come from? Uh, again, let's stick on the trail of men and women. And uh, what better place to start than Home Secretaries? So here's Theresa May, MP, obviously currently in post, uh, ultimately responsible for what is going on with Britain's police force and certainly with detailed knowledge of the training programmes. But of course, she's just one in post at the moment. Many people have been in that post previously over the time period. And these people must have also known what the plan for the police was. So we've got Alan Johnson. Uh, we've got Leon Britton. Well, of course, there's a trustworthy gentleman. Uh, we've got Jack Straw uh, and Charles Clark. Where's Jack Straw? Here he is. He's coming in. And uh, we can also bring in Mr. Blunkett. And I know that people up in the Sheffield area will be wincing uh, because many of them said, well, Blunkett failed to assist when there was massive fraud and corruption being uncovered uh, within uh, public services in Sheffield. So the changing in policing isn't simply an accident. It's something that's been put together step by step. And before we come back to David, let's just run through this little uh, diagram here. Uh, we've got the situation at the moment where we've had a private company, the Association of Chief Police Officers, um, somehow entrusted by the government with creating police policy. Well, we can see what they've done. They've taken a good police service and uh, made it into a brutal paramilitary force. Um, what sort of people have been involved? Um, well, here we've um, uh, got one of the former chief constables. Uh, go online and see who, who these people are and what they've been up to. And uh, we can come in now with a new body, yet another private company or is it because uh, NPCC at the moment doesn't want to answer questions from UK Column as to their legal status. Um, Who have they put in charge? Well, here she is, Sarah Thornton, former boss of Thames Valley Police, widely criticised for her failure to get to grips with child abuse, just the lady to promote as chair of NPCC. Um, I'm going to use the terrible UK column phrase, you just couldn't make it up because uh, the evidence is all in front of our eyes. Any comments on the uh, uh, the gang there, David? Well, it's, it's a bit of a worrying group. And if you go back one or two previous Home Secretaries beyond that, it doesn't get any better. Um, the decisions are being made by people who are... Um, allegedly accountable, but we don't really see much real accountability. And we have to remember that there's no choice in the matter. The public have to really put up with this. If you um, look at the sort of problems that were being dis discussed at the recent uh, conference, the British Constitution and UK Column Conference in Telford, we had a whole series of people who'd suffered at the hands of the police, uh, where you had police lying quite blatantly 
um, and obviously under oath in court, and, and nothing happened. The court should be down on that like a ton of bricks, but nothing happened. There was no responsibility. They were not held to account. The people who were doing this were not held to account. It's also interesting to see that in the United States we've had this week uh, only because of a citizen with a with a mobile phone with a video camera on it, we've had one policeman who, who gunned down a citizen um, for no reason it would appear, perhaps other than the colour of his skin. Um, at, a, at a motor stop, he had a brake light out or something and the man ended up, man, father of four, I, I seem to have heard, uh, ended up dead. And there was a whole story concocted about what had happened. And the story was revealed to be a pack of lies by video. Uh, this was reported on the BBC in Scotland in quite an interesting way. It was put forward that there's obviously a problem in America, and the problem is the American Constitution and the American love of guns and the fact that this is enshrined in the con Constitution, uh, being somehow responsible for this man's death which seems odd when you consider the American Constitution, for all its flaws, has the bit about carrying arms in there in order that citizens can prevent a government becoming tyrannical. And the situation that they were discussing was a government becoming tyrannical. So it seems a bit unreasonable to blame it on the American Constitution, more reasonable to blame it on failure to adhere to their Constitution. Well, David, I uh, totally agree with that. I've seen the film clip, and of course that American police officer simply shoots the black man in the back. Um, obviously, American police are not being taught to subdue people by shooting them in the head, but just utterly cold, callous. I'm going to use this phrase, low empathy people. Are they recruited in that state or are they actually uh, trained? Well, let's get into police training. I'm just going to put this rather complex uh, picture up. Because of time, I, I can't run through it in a simple way, but anybody who wants to freeze the video later can obviously look at the detail. What we've done there is produced a little flow diagram showing how uh, the police have had their oath changed from an oath to Queen and Country to an EU compliant declaration. And then step by step, a number of things have been put in place uh, in order to take police from being the men and women who were largely res highly respected in Britain to turn them into the central, central picture there, which is thuggish, brutal behaviour. And uh, we must mention, of course, Britain's judiciary uh, because they've sat idly by whilst uh, these um, very dangerous changes have been made to policing. And as you've said, in many cases, the courts have absolutely backed up the police even when they've been lying, committing perjury, etc. I better add at this stage, as always, we know that there are many very good policemen and women out there doing their job. Uh, we hope that you will also be watching this video to understand some of the changes happening in your police force around you. And we know many policemen and women simply do not understand the changes they're witnessing. Well, let's have a look at how some of this has been brought in. What better place to start than the College of Policing? Uh, here we are. You can visit this uh, website. Have a look at the documents yourself. This is the lady we're interested in, uh, Professor uh, Shirley Pierce, um, Independent Chair of the College of Policing. Now, what sort of person would you want to uh, fulfill that role? Uh, well, in 2015, what you need is somebody who is... Uh, trained as a clinical psychologist, uh, just the person to understand how to run policing on Britain streets. Uh, is she analysing while well, we've now got these low empathy people uh, developing their own police policy? Uh, is she analysing or is she the cause of the change in policy? Uh, well, let's go on through. Here's the College of Policing. What else does it say? Well, we're bringing this bit here and um, We'll blow it up for you. The programme challenges leaders to step outside their comfort zone, try different approaches and reinvigorate their creative thinking. Participants can expect to return to the workforce with renewed energy and an insight into how they can enable their organisation to thrive and work successfully with partners. So nothing about preventing crime. This is all about uh, playing around with the mindsets of senior police officers 
in order to uh, create a new agenda. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, of course, uh, what better organization to help this than the political charity Common Purpose? And here is a list of just a few officers in Greater Manchester Police alone who have been trained by the political charity Common Purpose, the very same charity that encourages people to lead outside their authority. And of course, as I've just said, or said earlier that uh, it's the same charity that says if people don't do what they're told to run over them. Well, the moment Common Purpose has been involved in the police, we can expect the police to start lying. Uh, this was an early letter to Devon and Cornwall Police asking for details about the financial expenditure on Common Purpose. The reply was uh, very interesting. Uh, we'll blow this up on screen uh, because they basically said uh, this is to inform you that they cannot identify any specific records or documents to do with expenditure on common purpose. Well, that was remarkable because, of course, at the time, the UK column could easily name some of the people who'd been trained by common purpose, and it included the chief constable herself at that time, Maria Wallace. Uh, there was a detective chief inspector, Ian Grafton, and other members of staff. So once Devon and Cornwall Police uh, Freedom of Information team had that information, uh, well, uh, what a surprise, they suddenly came up with a figure. Let's have a look at how much it was. Well, here it is. It was a mere £57,000 spent on common purpose training. Um, but it gets better because when we asked for more detail, that caused a problem. Uh, should be able to highlight this down the bottom, hopefully because they said we're currently seeking the views of Common Purpose on disclosure of the information we hold. So a police force had to consult a political charity in order to release information concerning the expenditure of public money. Something we've highlighted this week is that British Transport Police have now been brought into partnership with uh, other police forces in UK. And here was a Common Purpose Chief, uh, sorry, Common Purpose Trained Chief Inspector, Ellie Birds, Ellie Bird, originally from West Midlands Police, but she later joined the Transport Police. And the moment she did, expenditure on Common Purpose soared. And I'll just uh, read out the figures there. Uh, we've got a sum of £42,000 and a sum of £5,500. Why does Common Purpose want to get into the police? Uh, well, it's for this simple reason. Here we've got minutes of a Leeds advisory group meeting. This is Common Purpose Advisory Group. And I should be able to ring at the top. One of the board members is Jeff Dodd, the Divisional Commander, West Yorkshire Police. What did Common Purpose say this police officer's role was? Well, here we are. Uh, they said that he, amongst others, was to be the eyes and ears of Common Purpose. So a political charity with roots in the Marxist organisation Demos is now at work controlling what police do. And we'll give you a couple more. Here's um, uh, West Yorkshire Police. And in a letter about an advisory group meeting, um, it's being circulated uh, by a senior police officer, Assistant Chief Constable Steve Smith, is doing common purpose business on headed police notepaper in police time. Well, when we've challenged Common Purpose that they're using NLP to reframe people, of course, they denied it. Uh, this was their denial. Uh, but interestingly enough, at the bottom, it actually says, well, don't worry, because we're using methodology associated with David A. Kolb. And I'll leave people to have a look at that. And to ram it home, before I pass back to you, David, uh, what have we got here? Well, we've got Maria Wallace herself, the former chief constable of Devon and Cornwall Police. And this is what she said about a common purpose training course, intensive and fascinating insight into decision making at the top level. 2020 has helped me to understand the mechanics of policy making in the UK and Europe and how to influence it. So suddenly the lady responsible for policing pretty rural area of Devon and Cornwall now believes that part of her role is to influence European policy. 
Could we make it any easier? What's your view? Yes. <clears throat> the the move towards a single police force in Scotland's not helped the cause because it's all about central control. If you're going to change how people think, you require this central control and having a multitude of different forces means that different ideas can still flourish, that that people can point at a neighbouring area, even if they're under a fairly authoritarian police force themselves. They can point at a neighbouring area and say, look, it's not necessary. There is another way. In, in Scotland now, we've got one force. Um, there's now a move by the Nationalist government to remove British Transport Police from operation in Scotland and make that part of Police Scotland. Currently, British Transport Policemen take two oaths. They take an oath uh, which is uh, which applies in Scotland and one which applies in England and Wales so that they can operate in the whole of the UK. Well, that will be done away with and it, all of that will be brought under the uh, the control of Sir Stephen House. We still have a separate police force for nuclear facilities and I think there's some other specialist force uh, as well, but, but British Transport Police looks set to go. Right, David, uh, thank you. Sorry. sorry to cut in slightly. Uh, we've only got a few seconds remaining. I just wanted to bring this lady on screen. Here she is. Um, this is uh, Theresa, uh, Cressida Dick, uh, former head of counterterrorism and, of course, common purpose guru. Very, very big in common purpose. Uh, we say, was she accountable to the police or common purpose? Uh, well, what's happened to her? Well, she's now moved on uh, into a top job in the Foreign Office. Um, nobody knows what that job is. So the lady who, as the Mail article said, bungled the operation that led to the death of innocent Brazilian uh, Jean-Charles de Menezes, she has now uh, been promoted into the Foreign Office for some sort of secretive job. I'm afraid we've got to leave it there. Uh, for those of you saying, what do we do about this? The key thing is to be exposing what is really happening educating uh, people who are in the police force so that they can work to rectify the situation from the inside and keep blasting this information in the faces of every public official that you can uh, because the people who wake up to what's really happening can then take the required action to deal with it. Support your neighbours. We need peaceful support amongst people in the country and uh, we need as much publicity as possible. Don't forget to uh, let the reporters in the mainstream press and media know what is actually going on. Many of them are good people. They're simply ignorant as to what's really happening in the country. To leave you on a light-hearted note uh, for the weekend, I'm going to say thank you very much to our new viewer from Peru. Uh, a very wonderful email this morning with lots of really good information which will bring up in due course. Um, Peru, of course, home to Paddington Bear. So no doubt the UK Column Live is beginning to spread worldwide. On that note, David, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for the rest of our viewers, listeners and supporters. Th um, thank you. I'm off to buy some Lego. <laughs> OK, you buy your Lego. And uh, we, we will be back on Monday at one o'clock. Thank you. Bye bye.